I mean, what was your first impression? What, standing up on the on the bluff there, what did what did you think? This is it. Yeah. It was that simple. Kaiser is uh, an anomaly. How would you describe your dad? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> so he's my dad. <laughs> I mean, the man is is sharp, uh, extremely intuitive, and yet his decision-making process is incredibly simple. I think he catches a lot of people off guard. He's pretty casual, easygoing, no airs about him. The feel that, that people get when they, when they get there, everybody just always seems so happy. The staff is so great, the staff is so genuine, and that all comes from Mr. Kaiser. It's a lovely hat, but I do think we should take it off. <laughs> a, little bit, a, little, a little bit too much. Yeah, most people have thought so so far this morning. It's the first time I've worn it probably in about 10 years. Well, my name's Shu, and uh, my mama didn't name me that. My name's Bob Gaspar. Uh, I, I've done a lot of things at the golf course, starting out as the first caddy master, and now I'm the director of outside happiness, if you can believe that. Who, who came up with that? Is that you? That would be Mr. Kaiser. I've now had the opportunity to work for dozens of developers, and they'll have focus groups and uh, all sorts of analysis. And, and Michael's sitting there and go, I like Coors Light, and I, I'm not sure if I like a double patty or a single patty. I think Coors Light and a single patty cheeseburger is best. I'm mean, just gonna swing. Yeah. Uh, let me have you start by giving your name and uh, occupation. Mike Kaiser. I own Band and Golf Band and Dunes Golf Resort. Tagline in the Bane and Dunes Pro Shop, and I will never forget seeing this because I, I truly think it, it changed the way I think about golf, and it's it's very simple. It just says, "Golf as it was meant to be." The holes are brilliant, the scenery is brilliant, of course, but it's actually everyone there is dead set on you having a great time, going home and telling your buddies how great of a time you have, and you coming back with your buddies a few years later. And that's exactly the what you want to do. As soon as you walk off, you're saying, all right, when are we coming back? Who are we coming back with? Let's expand it. Let's do it bigger next time because it is truly a place you want to visit many, many times in your life. Morning, Neil. We're heading out of gear art. A little bit of coffee, maybe a scone. A little brekkie. Maybe start there. Some yeah. brekkie for the kids. Uh-oh, here comes Dad. Uh-oh. Oh, God. It's the north. Oh, God. I didn't mean to blow up your shot. Yeah, what's up? Uh, I was just going to say, basically, I think... The episode is like talking about the destination or what it's like to go on a long travel day and then finally like arrive there. Isn't a dad telling us what to do? Are you the cops? What, what's your problem? You gotta dude? tell us if you're the cops. Gonna, no, why can't gonna, we just go get into trouble? And then you're not gonna you're gonna forget to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not, Dad. All right, we'll see you guys there. Okay. Get out of my room. All right, let's do it. Washington. Lewis and Clark National. We're like Lewis and Clark of NLU today. Yeah. All the rest of the boys are just going down to Bandon. We're, you know, we're pushing the limits, baby. Adventurers. Explorers. The first time I went to Bandon Dunes, it was the trip of a lifetime. At least to that point for me, I had never been anywhere like it. It had been on the calendar for five months, maybe. I had poured over the hole by hole on the website, 
I could have told you the yardage and the par of every hole on every golf course. Every time I've gone back, I've actually had more appreciation for it. It's not just a great place to see one time. It has so much nuance to it and so much substance that you need multiple visits. You need to see it in different conditions. You need to experience it multiple times to truly appreciate the greatness of it. And I don't know how many times I'd have to go back to really feel like I fully have a grasp on it, but I know that three visits is not enough. I think people get so excited to go because there is truly nothing like this stateside. The scenery on which it sits, the cliffs, like I, I know I've seen a ton of pictures of it, but you don't really appreciate until you're standing out on those edge holes how high up you are. You're not next to the ocean, you are above the ocean. The one of the things I always look forward to about going to Bannon is the actual drive from, even from Eugene, like through the forest to get there and down the coast, it feels like you're on a bit of an adventure. Like you feel like you're going to the edge of the earth. And once you get out to that edge of the earth, it makes you appreciate it that much more. As soon as I was old enough to, uh, for her to trust, my mother to trust me riding my bike two miles to East Aurora Country Club, I'd do that every day all summer long and play golf, eat hamburgers, and caddy. And it was just nothing but fun. So I did that for five years. And that hooked me on golf. It, I, I built the Dunes Club in New Buffalo, Michigan when I was st still in the greeting card company, and it was so much fun. I, I had fun in the greeting card company. Uh, but then I built the Dunes Club, and it was even more fun. So I, I thought, uh, sort of subconsciously, if I sold the greeting card company, I could build at least one more golf course because it's really fun to build golf courses. You know, we made some some family trips back in the early mid '90s, and we'd come to the southern coast and walk the beach and go kayaking and go on hikes. So I think we all thought, "Wow, what a great trip! Oregon, beautiful, amazing." Little did I know, being the youngest of four, that he was planning to one day build Bannon Dunes or something similar. I think I was the only one that I know of who had a model. My model was Royal Dornick. It's, as you know, quite remote, five hours from Edinburgh. And yet every time I've been there, which is probably five, six, seven visits, there are tour buses disgorging American golfers like us. Lynx Golf. Uh, most Americans didn't know this, and maybe they still don't. Lynx golf is just nature's way of recreating. So I felt if I had, if I found a site and did the did uh, found the right architect to do a Lynx like Lynx course, it just might work. That's no one agreed. <laughs> How much time are we gonna be on the road? I think I don't have it plugged in yet, but I think it's five and a half hours. But the strap boys know how to make a five and a half hour trip, eight hours, you well, know what I'm saying? Awesome. We're about two minutes into the journey. Get a little, yeah, little coffee. Get a little coffee break already. Come on, what do you expect from me? Uh, tough Ooh. start. Okay. It's been a wonderful 32 years of good food and great times. Dude, that was not the vibe I wanted to start that trip on. Good message for me today too. It's a Carl Marlantis double. You highly recommended by you, and then you're picking up his new one, Deep River. I talked to friends and bankers, etc., and they convinced me that it was a highly speculative venture. Was there any anxiety about that? I mean, what, what did that? What was that? What did that feel like? Uh, th that felt like give it five years and uh, and it will fail and then uh, turn into a sheep ranch, which is where the sheep ranch name came from. What do you do with a failed pasture? You put sheep on it. We so we ended up selling the greeting card company in 2005, but I began buying land uh, in Oregon in mid 80s. Why Oregon? Because I uh, I was not succeeding in finding a big a 500 acre or bigger sand site on the East Coast. Try it. <laughs> <laughs> They're not existent as far as I could tell. So my friend Howard McKee from Portland, Oregon said, well, if you're not succeeding in the East Coast, you should take a look at Oregon. 
And the word got out among the uh, <clears throat> Southern Oregon real estate brokers that a uh, crazy guy from Chicago was looking for an ocean site. And Annie Huntimer, a broker from Gold Beach, Oregon, was one of the people who understood that. She called me blind and said, I don't know anything about golf. <clears throat> but I, I know of a, a site that's 1,200 acres right on the ocean, big sand dunes covered in gorse and Scottish, uh, Scottish broom. I don't know if that's good or not. Cheese! Here we come, baby. Big guy, are you, uh, you lactose intolerant? No, very tolerant of all lactose. Moved here with my brand new wife uh, in 1980. Well, we used to come out here and, and uh, uh, with our four-wheel drive trucks guys that come out with their with their dirt bikes and just beat around here. He said the property was just like a lot of property uh, on the coast here. It was just a, a bunch of scrub brush, gorse. This land had been on the market for five years. No one wanted it. So it was like, I, I wanted to build a remote golf course, which no one thought was a good idea. And these these three old guys who were very nice from Seattle couldn't believe their good their good good fortune when I showed up and said, would you sell this 1,200 acres? There was a piece in the paper and uh, a Chicago businessman by the name of Michael Kaiser was going to do us a huge favor by coming out here and building a golf course out here. And just about to a person in town, because we're all, you know, we're talking about this, it's like, you know, it's crazy. You know, who's going to, first of all, who's going to come, you know? This passing zone's like an F1 race. Car feels good, let's push it. Overtake, overtake. overtake. No box, no box this lap, no box this lap. P2. Good job, Neil. Great job, team. Not an easy place to get to, admittedly, mm -hmm. out here. Uh, <laughs> do you think that's a positive or negative? It's become a positive. I mean, I think remote golf is now pretty much established as the best because all the, if, if you're looking for sand, and I think uh, Bannon Dunes has convinced a lot of people that sand is the best medium for great golf, and certainly Lynx golf. So where do you find sand dunes? In remote places. Like uh, Trump says that golf is retail, retail, retail. Uh, I took the opposite tack and said, uh, Lynx golf is almost by definition remote. You mentioned Sand Hills, you mentioned Pine Valley. I'm, I'm curious, was there ever any thought to making this, you know, the uh, Pine Valley of the West? Yeah, private, private club. No. Why not? I felt that the Dudes Club was very successful attracting members. Uh, but I, uh, given the experience of attracting members and getting calls from people who couldn't afford it but wanted to play, I realized that I, I sort of made a mistake with the Dudes Club. And I've had a very liberal, unaccompanied guest policy ever since. But. My experience starting a private club convinced me that anything else I'd do in golf is be public. Randy currently P6, P6. Come on guys, I need more power! Engine looks good. Plus, push the car, please push the car. I think the essence of a good golf course starts with a great piece of land. Uh, and it's the exploration of that piece of land that makes great golf. It's not individual golf holes. It's a bit like uh, an album. You know, how many albums can you think of where there was one good track or two good tracks? It's not a great album. A great album is every track. How would you describe David for someone who's never met him? Uh, uh, entertainer. I am David McClay Kidd, born and raised in Scotland, and I am a golf course architect to my very core. What does that mean? Uh, I was born on a golf course. I'm the son of a greenkeeper. Uh, I spent my entire childhood uh, on the best and finest Lynx courses in the world. Uh, I know nothing else. Golf in the British Isles is so much more than just 
uh, a scorecard. You know, it's all about exploring the landscape and enjoying time outside with your friends and figuring out how to win a hole because it's almost always match play. It's not stroke play. The stroke play is something we Brits do uh, once a month to confirm our handicap. The rest of the time, I just want to beat you. Growing up, my dad really wanted to expose my, my brother and I to great golf and what he thought of as amazing links experiences. You know, early trips being eight, nine, 10, going to Northern Scotland and playing Brora, you know, where sheep and cattle are, are roaming. And once again, not much else going on, but you go there to play golf. Or, you know, Dukes in Southwest Ireland, which is awesome. So the, the 16th green site today is the sort of iconic spot on the whole resort. It, it sits on a headland, uh, sort of 270 degrees views in every direction from Cape Arago to Cape Blanco. For any developer, any seasoned developer, that's where your clubhouse goes. That's where your hotel goes. That's where your spa goes. I mean, whatever it is, that's where you're gonna put it. But not Mike Kaiser. For him, the golf was the most important thing. And he and I were simpatico on that. If the golf is the most important thing and we're building out a symphony, the whole crescendo is 16 green. That's where it's gonna happen. That was the sales pitch? What, what do you remember about your first meeting with him? My first meeting with Mike Kaiser, that is a really interesting question. I would have hired Tom Doak, but he was terrible Tom at the time, and I thought that he would do a good job, but the writers would all say, what a jerk, and somehow he smirched the, uh, the golf course. Bill and Ben were the other, the other two, the other guys on my list. They, had been, they were doing Sand Hills, Nebraska, so Dick Young's kid beat me to them. That left me with, who do you build a links course with? And along came Ian Ferrier, the marketing guy, very nice guy. Mike, we're here. You're building. You're here. You're building a Lynx golf course. I'd like you to come over to Gun Eagles and meet Jimmy and David Kidd. And I thought that uh, Jimmy was very knowledgeable, and uh, David might be okay. And if they weren't, I'd confire them. <laughs> we started on a handshake, and they did a wonderful job. I didn't get very far. <laughs> Quick pit stop here, Dutch Bros. Randy's first time. Wow, I didn't realize first timers get a free drink. Uh, they do, yeah. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, just let them know that you're first, I'm bringing the big guys, a first timer. Free coffee for you, just a little bit of cream. I came here with my father, Jimmy Kidd, in July of 1994. Uh, and we met Shorty Dow, the old caretaker of the land. And he wandered us through all of the land that Mike had bought something like 1,600 acres. The Coke Bannadon sits on 250, to give you an idea. So I, there's enough space for 10 golf courses, even back then. During that week, my father and I had concluded that this was indeed an amazing piece of land that could uh, be the birthplace of True Links golf in America. However, we also learned, because we'd never met Mike, that this guy was a very successful, wealthy businessman from Chicago that could hire anyone. Why in the hell? hire us? Why would he hire me? I didn't have anything. So I figured that I wasn't going to get hired. So when I met him, I, I kind of brashly told him that uh, Lynx go Golf in America wasn't Lynx Golf at all. Every golf course called itself a Lynx. And yet I watched guys drive around in golf carts hitting 60 degree wedges. What's Lynxy about that? So I told him, if you want to build a true Lynx course, you can't put the clubhouse out on the ocean. You gotta make them walk. And there's no golf carts and the fairways won't be flat. In fact, the golf won't even be fair as American golfers read it and they say, oh yeah, yeah. But they don't actually, there's a lot of talking the talk and not a lot of walking the walk. And Mike, strangely enough, was willing to walk the walk. He said, yeah, let's do that. Talk to me about the first time you saw the golf course. We're up on the 10th tee. Uh, and Shorty's given a talk and, and he's about done. And just then, the two unbelievably grungy guys come running by us with golf clubs. I look at Shorty and say, what's going on? Who are those guys? You know, that was David Kidd and his shaper, Jim Haley. <laughs> when we built the golf course, I, there was no contractor. So I literally went and found fishermen from the harbor or loggers from the bar. And I put together my own little crew of machine operators and local labor uh, and in order to 
to create that camaraderie and bond that team around me, I partied pretty hard. So I would go down to the bar in, in the evening and I would hand my credit card over to uh, the barman at Lloyd's Abandon and I would say when that card hits 250 bucks you have to stop. When I was building the golf course I had zero anxiety. I was in my early to mid 20s and I had ice water in my veins and felt that I was absolutely totally 100% bulletproof. Uh, I felt extremely confident, too confident uh, and of course as you age you know, you, you start to realize all the mistakes you could have made, all the things you might have done better, all the things you shouldn't have said. Uh, could I have built it 10 years later? Maybe not. You know, the, the, the ignorance of youth is a pretty powerful thing. Take me to the moment when you found out that you were the guy. Uh, I, I don't know if I was ever the guy. You know, Mike Kaiser's fallback through my whole uh, adventure here creating Band of Dunes was uh, if you build a bad hole I'll just fire you and I'll just hire someone else. Match play, hole by hole by hole. And the first hole I built was number 12. I think I did okay, maybe I went one up. And the next hole I built was 15, I think I got two up. And the next hole I built was 16. It's over. I was three <laughs> up. I was three up after three. Uh, Tom Doak bristles when I uh, override him. Uh, Coor is, a, as you probably know, a very diplomatic person, and he may chafe uh, without showing it, but he's very much, yes, I hear you, Mike. And David Kidd is a star with that. He's, uh, he's just a natural, yeah, that's a good idea, Mike. Now, what if we change that just a little bit? Most involved client I've ever had. You know, he, he comes in probably every third week or so. He did when we built this. Uh, and he flies in with a bunch of his, what he calls retail golfer buddies who are, you know, doctors and dentists and lawyers and insurance salesmen. Uh, and he uh, allows them to say their piece. And as a golf course architect, that can be really, really frustrating. You know, you, you understand uh, why you're doing something and it's in mid flow. I mean, you're, you're, you haven't built it yet. You're, you're in the process and you know, Mike's dentist says, you know, I really don't like this hole. I, 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 don't, I don't think it should dog leg right. I think it should dog leg left. And Mike goes, hmm, that's an interesting idea. 20 years later, we've learned that when Mike tells these guys, yes, it usually means, yes, I heard you, not yes, I agree with you. So that, that makes me feel better. Sorry, Pie Man, we missed the sign. Came a little hot there. <laughs> Randy's P1 coming P1. in hot. We made it. TC, we have arrived. Ooh, that was a drive, man. It was, listen, man, the, you know, the journey is the destination. It is, it is, but this is also the destination. <laughs> in a truer sense though, this is the destination. This is a pretty good destination. When you get there, it's probably not super early in the day, just because you've had a travel day or you've at least had to drive. The only activity that makes sense, or I guess the perfect activity, is to go down to the Bandon Preserve, the par three course, 13 holes. You get to just experience everything that comes with Bandon in terms of the views, the firm turf, the greens, the approach shots. If your driver isn't working maybe on some of the big golf courses there, you might not get to hit as many approach shots that you would be able to hit You know, if you are driving it well. That's the beauty of Bandon Preserve. You get to bypass the driver, and you get to hit 13 of them in one of the most idyllic settings you could possibly imagine. I can't imagine, you know, a, a quote unquote tack on activity in golf being any more fun than preserve is.
Watching the public play at Bannon Dunes the first time and the last time is the same feeling. It, 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 you go in the bar at Bannon Dunes and all you hear is laughter. And whether they're talking about the golf course or talking about their lifelong friendship, uh, they're doing it here. Uh, and that always gives me uh, the goosebumps. Uh, and that's what the golf course does. It's so much more than just the landscape or just the golf or just the cold beer. Uh, and Bandon, for all of those reasons, has had that impact on pushing a million people at this point. The, the number of people that have come in 20 years and not one of them left without a better friendship than they came with. To me, Bandon is, it's Disneyland. I mean, you come here just wanting to, you know, eat, sleep, drink, talk, you know, think about golf and, you know, you can play from sunup to sundown, probably, you know, three, four, five days in a row and not be bored and not see the same shot twice. Ultimately, it was the, the golf experience that got me. So the, the private club I worked at, I could tell you still to this day, every shot I would need to hit on the golf course to get myself around the, the course. And I wouldn't hit anything besides two clubs until the seventh hole. And out here you need 14 clubs, you need to know how to use them 50 different ways. You know, you'll have a lot of, a lot of highs and like heroic, awesome shots. And you also kind of get kicked in the teeth. Even in lousy weather, this is what really gets me sometimes. It's hot, you know, shoot, we were here last year, God, wind was blowing 40 miles an hour, it was pouring rain. While they're saying this, they're smiling. I said, well, yeah, you, you came back. Well, yeah, we love this place. Um, I'm astonished that it basically has worked as well as it has. Going back to day one, when everyone said it's an idiotic thing to do, and my expectation that I would fail to break even, I'm just astonished that the golf world has been as supportive as it has. What, what are you most proud of? Uh, showing the American golfer that Lynx golf is as good as the Scots and the Irish have always known. What am I most proud of? I don't know that there's anything I'm not proud of. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that I get to uh, be immortalized by this. It's gonna sit here for millennia. Uh, and my part in it will be instrumental. Uh, I'm most proud of the fact that Bannon Dunes, I feel, was the ground zero for destination golf in America, for buddies trips in America, for the reintroduction of minimalist, naturalistic golf in America. I mean, all of those things, I think I humbly get to play some role in. I, I was able to be part of that introduction. Mike is obviously the, the brainchild behind all of it but the few people that were his lieutenants that actually brought that to reality, you know, we all get immortalized in that.